dear students let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 3rd march 2017 the first article campaigning on a budget here we will be discussing about electoral funding in india and electoral corruption we synonymously use various terms such as party funding political funding and equate them with political corruption but however they mean different things now the party funding in india on average per annum for all the parties together it is around 1000 crores and it is slowly rising to 2000 crores now but however the major part is the political funding the political funding involves both the electoral expenditure and also the party funding so most of the expenditure made by the political parties and candidates contesting the elections is during elections it is to the tune of around 30000 crore rupees plus so the major emphasis or regulation or control if it has to come it has to be on the electoral funding rather than on the party funding alone recently in the budget it has been announced that the 20000 rupees limit for the anonymous decision, anonymous donations is reduced to 2000 rupees it is going to impact the party funding but not the electoral funding and second electoral bonds are being issued that is also meant for party funding but not for the electoral funding so the emphasis of reform is more on the party funding rather than on the electoral funding most of the money is getting involved in the electoral funding and they are trying to influence the public opinion through money power again we also have a notion that any political party receiving the private funds is corrupt understand this in a competitive electoral democracy the political parties have to depend upon the donations they receive every democracy functions similarly it means any donation coming to a political party shall not be equated with a political corruption but here Bernie Sanders in the United States of America Barack Obama they have changed this pattern of donations previously in american elections mnc's and big corporates have dominated the funding political funding but bernie sanders and barack obama they started taking dollar 5 donations from every believer in their views so they made the donations by and large from the public rather than from the big corporates similar trend has to happen in india too people shall fund the political parties rather than the corporates funding them and the second is let us see the adr association for democratic reforms findings in the party funding also most of the political parties they want to show their funds as as received less than 20000 from anonymous sources it's a kind of quid pro quo which is happening where a corporate which has gained from a policy of the government which is formed from a political party will give the donations to the party or a 10% of the money let's take in a project it is a cut it goes through black money route to this particular political parties which they show in their account books as the donations less than 20000 rupees but however it's a very minuscule compared to the electoral funding and the second thing is once a person gets elected as a mla and he is going to search for ministerial berth which is again dependent on the patronage shown by the high command so this politics of the patronage is providing for or bringing in extreme loyalties to the political families and the lineage politics are continuing in india so we have to decentralize the political system and provide for greater credibility to the elections in india one of the recommendations made was um, a state sponsoring the elections in india so let us see further on to this now insurgent in the white house in the last decade there is a movement which is becoming very much popular in usa that is called alternate right movement generally the rightist the republicans were considered as rightist and democrats as right centrists in the united states of america an alternative right 
it believes in white supremacist nationalism and it sees america as a nation with a culture it's a cultural entity and that culture is nothing but a white culture and then they are opposed to globalization so their views favor misogyny racial and ethnic exclusivism anti immigration etc mr benon the chief strategist for mr trump belongs to this alternate right movement and the most powerful person in the world is hearing to him then obviously world is going to be much divided because they, his world view or alternate right movement's world view is um, the christianity is in war with islam or christianity and judy uh, uh, Ju- i mean this uh, israel judaism is in danger for uh, from jihadist islamism this is what is the world view of these people so in this context the world is going to get much polarized uh, than before coming to manipur issue already we have discussed this in depth so in manipur the ibobi singh government it has created seven new districts for administrative convenience which did not go well with the nagas they see it as making the nagas minorities in their own regions or isolating the nagas from majority of the manipur and it is going to threaten the dream of greater nagaland so now this is this shall be seen from electoral politics which are going on in manipur the bjp wants to take its hold in the eastern india the northeastern india after winning the assam elections so we have to see how it unfolds next is conciliatory and sketchy this is about mr trump's address to the congress in the united states of america his tone has become soft and softened so here is two things have to be highlighted one is he is towards free trade but also fair trade where customs duties have to be lowered for american products by the other countries so it means that in india we are going to get into a situation or a pressure for lowering the customs duties and domestic content requirements and relaxation of the norms towards entry of the foreign goods and the second thing is the on the immigration which he was very much opposed and vocal he want to, he spoke about merit based immigration which is being implemented by the other countries in spite of this soft rhetoric the in the soft tone there is also rhetoric in his voice so though by late he has condemned the hate crime in kansas city by and large is uh, supporters etc they belongs to the alternate right and white supremacy nationalists and we have to see how the administration goes on further now let's come to are our campuses under siege here i am not going to get into a political controversy of the things but i want to tell you about the importance of a university and education for me education is a change in life it's a catalyst for change again i say you as this way if you and me are coming together there is something called education in between so education changes the world changes the people creates new perspectives in young mind and here university plays a critical role let me say it this way when we are young we start or we are we start talking posing questions and as we become or else get into teenagers we start questioning and we start critically arguing so these skills have to be further nurtured and streamlined in such a way that they have to provide for collective prosperity and development this is what the universities does universities streamline our thoughts brings in collective release of our energies and they also provide a space for critical thinking and argument and the third thing is in every country where the vibrant university system exists the societies are able to reflect themselves and progress united states is a very typical example now today in the same page you have another column to all indian parents so a university professor from washington she clearly states that we are there for you don't get worried about what is happening in the united states of america so that is what is the climate you will see in the universities and then 
Finally, from a leftist view, universities are the places where revolutionary consciousness has to come up. This revolutionary consciousness as a word, it is very much important as for the Leninism. Understand, the Marxian and Lenin theory, they have fine difference. According to Lenin, a revolution need to be induced and a revolutionary consciousness shall be developed in a society. This revolutionary consciousness will be developed by enlightened bourgeois. So universities are the places where this revolutionary consciousness develops. And let us see the authoritarian regimes. Either it is fascism in the case of uh, Italy, Nazism in Germany, Stalin's Russia, Cambodia, China. Everywhere the authoritarian regimes they have reflected the following. So they, either it is rightist or leftist. Every authoritarian regime went against the free speech and free thinking, where the universities are supposed to nurture them. If you take Mao's China in the name of cultural revolution, there was a lot of violence and uh, miffling of voice in the universities. And the second thing is, any authoritarian regime, they want to bring in identity politics, especially the rightists, Nazism and fascism if you take them. So they want to bring in identity divisions in the society. On the other hand, leftists see the society as a class division. But how we see it has to be our freedom, our thought. We either to follow a, I mean, society as a class divide or an identity divide that our mind has to make up. The university shall give you that judgment. And finally, I want to say you one thing. I firmly believe that dialogue is the way forward for any solution. It cannot be through violence. Whatever the argument you bring in, the dialogue is the way forward. Here I remember the Socrates. I mean, I don't know the exact phrasing of it, but I can say it this way. So we all don't agree that we are ignorant. And he says he is better than all the others because at least he knows that he is ignorant. That's what the Socrates talks about. So our ignorance and has to be replaced by the knowledge. And this comes through wider exposure to the society and people around us. And the universities are the places which replace that ignorance with knowledge. And the attitude of the questioning is vital for this. Now, let's go to the public procurement needs to be opened up. Here the opinions are being expressed by Commerce Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and uh, economic advisor to the finance minister Aravind Subramanian. The first what she says is, in India 30% of the GDP accounts for public procurement. But this public procurement is um, filled with cartelization and also the collective bidding. Or let me say it this way, cartelization, let's take a government office wants to procure some 10 fans. All the fan suppliers, they will come together and they make a baseline or they, may, they agree for a baseline quotation that we don't supply it less than 1500 rupees. That is cartelization or collusive bidding we call it as. So they, I mean collusive bidding means or two or three competitors they get eliminated and they will be given certain money for that and there will be one or two will be left behind in the race. That is collusive bidding. So cartelization and collusive bidding are the major reasons for the rise in government expenditure with relation to public procurement. So it has to end and competition has to come into the picture. That's what is Ms. Nirmala Srinita Raman talks about. Arvind Subramanian, he clearly states that privatization will not immediately bring in cartelization. Sorry, privatization will not bring in competition. So, a competition has to be ensured through a proper regulatory system put in place by the state. If not, the China and Russia are the examples where privatization has led to oligarchy. Oligarchy means one or two big players are existing rather than one big player that is called government. And now, the GST levy may go up to 40%. Force lab structure is going to remain. Now, it is just for a legislative convenience. Because as the GST bill is to be passed, the state GST and central GST peak levels will be kept at 20%. And it means that tomorrow, through consensus at the GST council, this can be raised. 
It means the existing four slabs with highest rate at 28% will continue, where 14% for the center, 14% for the states goes on. But maximum ceiling that can be imposed uh, will be kept at 20% for center GST and 20% for state GST. That is what has been stated. In this article, there is one more thing. India is becoming a highly litig litigious society. We are willing to go for court for every dispute. So as we are moving towards the courts again as the government, again as the private property, everything, then obviously the decision making by judiciary is getting promoted and it is also a reason for the judicial activism. And there is a new statement, India is on a new trust with destiny. Now, India e wants to emerge, it, emerge itself as a democratic superpower. So in this context, there are enormous challenges before India. So what are these challenges you need to probe into? But India is in a new trust for destiny. So in, uh, after immediately after independence, Prime Minister Nehru has spoken about uh, India's uh, trust with destiny. Now, let us see what is the new trust with destiny evolve. Finally, coming to the news, India to attend the Lahore meet on Indus Water Treaty. So Indus Water Treaty was mediated by Washington and a permanent Indus Commission is constituted with representatives from India and Pakistan. Any issue it will be solved by this permanent Indus Commission. It was actively working even during the war. And if an issue is not solved at this level, it can be, World Bank can be urged for intermediation. So we can go, either of the party can go for the World Bank and it can refer the matters for arbitration. So there are two projects which are being objected by uh, Pakistan. So these projects are, one is uh, related to Kishan Ganga project. The Kishan Ganga project is on the Jhelum river. So remember this for uh, our prelims. The Kishan Ganga project is on the Jhelum river and uh, uh, and the other project is Rattle project, uh, which is on uh, Chinab River. So both of them are opposed by Pakistan as violative of Indus Water Treaty. And Indus Water Treaty is cited as the best example in the world uh, for uh, water sharing between the countries. So, and also it is important from a diplomatic point of view, because after we stop talking to the Pakistan, this is the first time we are responding to it. So we have to see how it goes on. Thank you very much and all the best. And again, as well, I gave you the notes over here. Please go through that. It will be posted on laex.in slash civilsprep. Now, your helpline number will be call 9052292929 if the notes is not been posted. The person responsible for is Narasimha. And if you want to send me any message, you can WhatsApp on this particular thing. And then I will respond to it. And you can also send your DAFs. I have received some handful of DAFs on drrpaladgu at gmail.com. So I will also discuss each and every DAF in detail. And I will send those personalized videos for them. And I will be available in Delhi from uh, uh, Monday or Tuesday at best. You can meet me after 7.30 at uh, Vajiram and Ravi's teacher's room. Waji Ram and Ravi teachers room. I'll be available in Delhi. So in Hyderabad, you can meet me after 5 p.m. at Law Excellence, Ashok Nagar. Ashok Nagar. Thank you very much.